Hello again and welcome back to Bite Size Cook Roar. My name is David and uh, welcome back. And if you're joining me for the first time, I uh, uh, recommend viewing the very first video in this series, which is, should be linked below. That'll give you some more explanation. The long and the short of it is I'm not an expert. I'm not a professor or anything. I'm just a guy going through Kirk Roar's works. Uh, and then it kind of like highlighting things that I find interesting. So it's not complete. It might be you know, things that, that are different than what you get out of it. And I think that's fine. Uh, but yeah, just going through, you know, the whole, the whole series of books, and, and there's a lot. Uh, so I'll get started uh, right off, just have a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today we're going to do, we're going to continue on through either or. Uh, we're going to go through these two sections, the immediate erotic stages or the musical erotic and the second section is the tragic and ancient drama reflected in the tragic and modern drama. Um, so making our way through either or part one. Uh, and this is um, the author, the pseudonymous author A, uh, who is kind of sometimes has been kind of likened to a very emotional, uh, dare I say, like an emo character, <laughs> uh, very passionate. This is obviously uh, what Kirkor uh, often calls the aesthetic uh, with an E or an AE, uh, so very interested in art and poetry and music, and we'll get that today, obviously, in this uh, musical erotic. Well, wow, that's pretty, pretty, pretty spicy stuff. Uh, but yeah, so a little bit of housekeeping. So that that's a little preview of what we're in for today. Uh, and then, as I have been doing, I've been going through some uh, bookmarks that have been sort of like uh, given to me as an inheritance. Uh, so today we have a bookmark from a church in Brea, California, EV Free Church. <laughs> so um, my parent, grandparents used to go to that one. And it's got a quote, Bible quote on the back there, um, which is Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 uh, for reference. But um, yes, this, this bookmark is actually uh, back in the back part of this book because I've read ahead and I'm actually in the seducer's diary but let's get in ahead of our, ourselves that's another spicy area of the book um, we'll get to it very soon now uh, another little housekeeping thing uh, finally I finally tracked down this guy which is gonna be super cheesy uh, but I, I don't know uh, I don't know if you've seen this before um, they're called magnetic personalities uh, this so this is actually the Kierkegaard version. You know, this there's there's his name on there. That's him, sure enough. And he has a little bio on here that comes along with him, so he can kind of say like he can say who he is. Um, he's got a quote from him: "Philosophy is perfectly right in saying that life must be understood backwards, but then one forgets the other clause that must be lived forwards." Now, that's a pretty famous quote. And a little. Uh, overview. Um, this serves as a nice introduction too. I should have done this on the first video. A forefather of existentialism, Danish philosopher Soren Abia Kierkegaard uh, intentionally distanced himself from academia, schools or movements, and the crowd, in quote. Bitterly critical of both the church and Hegelian rationalism, Kierkegaard turned his attention to the subjective uh, at the core of Kierkegaard's work was the struggle against the despair and anxiety brought about by the burden of, ab of individual freedom. Uh, his solution was to choose faith, uh, in parentheses Christianity, uh, through though belief is beyond logic or reason, a uh, leap of faith. And that's a very famous uh, ex uh, expression um, we'll get into eventually. But yeah, here's our little friend. And he does, in fact, have a little magnet in his head here so you can stick him onto a refrigerator or whatever. Uh, I'll just sort of put him aside now. Okay, <laughs> okay so now that we've gotten that out of the way, um, we'll launch right into it. So this first part, this is a really interesting part. I, I have to say this is one of kind of my favorite parts of the book because it's really getting at something pretty interesting here. Um, kind of saying that music is a medium a medium in itself that kind of goes beyond words and it's going in kind of into like a mystical realm saying there's some things that can only be experienced and understood through music um, where words kind of fail at that point like words help words help us get part way through and indeed some music has lyrics to help it through and help people you know the actors uh, well, in this case, it's an opera. It's a, a Mozart opera, Don Giovanni. 
um, or actually a couple of operas in this case. Uh, Don Giovanni is kind of like the highlight. Uh, but yeah, the, the actors have words, but there's a lot of things that are expressed through the music, the, 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 the musicality of it, which is interesting. So, you know, it's very different than that, um, you know, what was mentioned in that summary, that Hegelian rationalism. Uh, they wouldn't say anything like, well, to understand, you just have to go see the opera, you know, like they would say, no, we can we can capture the essence in our writings. We could write everything about it and capture the essence in here in our system. Right. And Kierkegaard is saying, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so you um, but kind of ironically also writing about it in this pretty lofty, big section. But at the end, kind of admitting like you know kind of just go see the opera man like you know like like i've written but i acknowledging at the same time i've written about it but i know my words fall short kind of acknowledging that um there's a little irony there but like at the end of the day like okay now that you've read this just go see it and see what i'm talking about like experience it uh, and this is fun uh and Kirkor saw you know for instance like don giovanni so many times and he was a he was a fan of going to the theater and watching and there was some fun in it because there are some you know the reg regular actors um you know saying the same words but they would say it differently and do things differently you know little variations every night that so every performance would be kind of unique and, and different expressions would come out in the performance which is interesting and i really feel like i've been getting more into like watching movies like classic movies and things like this lately like a lot of the movies that show up in the criterion collection it's become a little bit of a somewhat bad spending habit but like i feel like if kirkar was around today he would really be into watching movies and and seeing that there's things in here that are interesting um that are that are hard to capture it's hard to describe and at the end of the day he might just say go go see the movie go experience it for yourself um yeah and and it you know maybe it'll, it'll resonate differently for every individual person and that's interesting right um I don't know if he says that directly, but I know he's kind of alluded to that before. Um, and that is kind of the way I, I perceive this. Uh, but yeah, we'll just go through this a little bit. Um, I like how this is kind of book ended. He starts with on page. So I'm using the original page numbers um, so you can match it up with your edition. Uh, if your edition has the original page numbers in the margin, hopefully. Uh, but starting on page 31 uh, of either or. Basically, book ended with uh, the in insignificant intro, and then the end is page one one thirteen. The insignificant postlude. So it's a little, it's kind of book ended, saying, "Ah, eh, this isn't really significant," and kind of at the end, kind of just throwing it out and saying, "Ah, eh, just go, you know, just go and see it." Maybe not that extreme, but uh, some books he does that. Um, uh, concluding unscientific postscript by the time you get to the end and you're like okay I think I know what's going on he's kind of just like I just renounce everything like whatever like um, if you're familiar with the analogy of, of Wittgenstein's uh, ladder it's kind of like throwing away the ladder once you've climbed up it and it's just sort of like eh. <laughs> it's just like like now that we've reached this level we don't need this ladder anyway that that's getting a little off track but uh, um, yeah I thought I thought it's interesting so uh, he's, you know, Kirkor is really getting enamored with Mozart's music, which is funny. So like seeing this in a couple operas, um, one is Don Giovanni. The, the other one is, uh, the magic flute. And, um, I believe there's another one here. Let me see. I got it all mixed up here. Oh, the, and Figaro, the page in Figaro is, is a character he talks about. He's talking about different stages of the aesthetic, really, which is what I was just talking about before. Um, different stages um, and trying to illustrate it with characters that are in these operas. Uh, so, and then kind of starting out saying we should really be considering these operas as kind of like almost like philosophical works. Like they should be treated along these things. Uh, you know, like Aristotle's works and things like that, like they should be elevated to that level because they bring out parts of, um, you know, the human condition that are interesting. Uh, and they're kind of like non, not traditionally, you know, philosophical, but they should be elevated to those, that list of like classic works at least, which is interesting. Um, a uh, little bit of talk about things getting more abstract and more removed from language. Uh, the more abstract they, they become. Um, the idea on page 40, music is like a 
succession of instants. I'm just kind of like highlighting things that jumped out. So sorry, it's a, it might be a little bit disconnected. Um, succession of instants is an interesting thing. This is a this is kind of like a preoccupation of Kirchhoff. I've seen like time and the idea of the present time uh, and then comparing it to the past and the future, of course, but like being obsessed with that instant uh, and in the, you know, we might say today, like in being in the moment and being in the present and so forth. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, Kirchhoff uh, edited a journal later on, which was just called The Instant, uh, which gives you an idea of how important this was in his thinking. And so, but he's saying music, you know, is just like one instant after another. It's like you're in, the, you know, you you can't anticipate the future. Uh, I guess you can think about past music and themes that get revived, you know, later on and so forth. But you're, for the most part, you're, you're act, if you're actively listening, you're listening from moment to moment that you're like right in with it, which is interesting. Uh, and this, yeah, page 44 uh, was kind of interesting. Uh, he's talking about also like rationalizing, you know, can we actually rationalize uh, Mozart? And saying like, well, at the at the moment that we actually, uh, you know, rationalize him, he's he's becoming, we, we kind of lose we lose the meaning of it. Interestingly enough, um, so this would drive some analytic philosophers crazy because of the double use of um, the kind of double entendre of what mean what comprehensible means. But let me just go have a go at this, and and we'll try to decipher it. Um, on page uh, 44. For one thing, what I have understood hitherto is only very little and enough will always remain hiding in the shadows of presentiment. For another, I'm convinced that if Mozart ever became entirely comprehensible to me, he would then become completely incomprehensible to me. So, you know, analog, analog philosophers would look at this and be like, what the hell? What is going on? You're just contradicting yourself. This is a paradox. Uh, no, really what he's saying is comprehensible in a way that if it becomes comprehensible like rationally then you're losing out on that that moment to moment thing and the thing that goes beyond the words right because you've explained it all with words you put it into your system you put it into a box and then you're losing out on the sort of magic the mystic quality that goes beyond that right it's something that can't be contained in that box so if you really think you can you know contain it like that then it really escapes you. Then it, you're you're losing out on on what it's about. Hopefully that that kind of gets at it. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, I thought that's a great expression. Though. Um, yeah, some talk here about Christianity and sensuality, um, immediately expressed in in music. In page forty seven, um, yeah, and then page forty eight, music should be considered itself a medium, uh, music as the medium. Um, and yeah, on page 49, kind of acknowledging we're using language to describe music, but it's right at the boundary. We're, we're at the limits of language. Like we're, we're going into, we're, we're approaching uncharted territories where language can't really do anything. Um, and so language, like, uh, language is a medium in itself and, but so is, is, uh, music really. Um, and then some talk about, yeah, language an element in time there's that time aspect again that reminded me of a film director Tarkovsky I think he has a book called like sculpting in time because he's a filmmaker and all film is about these again these like succession of instants and and things happening over time so language is an element in time yeah let me let me just skip ahead a bit to page 56 now and now he's trying to describe, so, so of course this essay is called The Immediate Erotic Stages. Um, and uh, Kirchhoff is famous for sort of these three different stages of existence. But here we're not talking about the, we're talking about just the first one, the aesthetic stage. Uh, and he's trying to break down, there's actually stages within stages. So, so in the aesthetic stage, we have these three stages. And they're maybe, they're not really independent, he says, which I think, can give us some, maybe we can apply this to the, the larger stages too. Uh, so just to break it down, you know, there's these, the overarching categories are the aesthetic stage, the ethical, and the religious stage. Uh, here he's just talking about these, the first one, that aesthetic stage. Um, but when he's saying I, uh, on page 56, um, 
Moreover, when I use the term stage as I did and continue to do, it must not be taken to mean that each stage exists independently, the one outside the other. I could perhaps more appropriately use the word metamorphosis. So maybe we can also apply that to, you know, those those bigger stages too, you know. Uh, and I also think about like maybe they can kind of blend together um, and maybe, you know, I feel like I, I can be, you know, more aesthetic one day, you know, depending on my moods and maybe more ethical the next day. Um, but maybe when he's talking about those overarching stages, maybe he's talking, talking about like the main driver in life, like what's the overarching driver? Um, in any case, like it's interesting how he kind of describes like they're not super, they're not like rigidly distinct. They kind of maybe it's like a butterfly metamorphosizing into it, you know, yeah, um, you know, a caterpillar more metamorphosizing into a butterfly. Um, so something like that, like they're not completely, I don't know, it, it's a process maybe. I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure I, I can explain that that well, or, or maybe I don't completely understand that. Um, but if that helps, uh, you know, th there it is for you. Um, but yeah, saying, breaking down these types of aesthetic existence into, and then putting them, you know, associating them with a character in uh, Mozart's works. Uh, the first one is the page, the character of the page in Figaro, which I'm not super familiar with, actually, the least familiar out of all of these. Um, but there's no... Um, there's no movement in this. It's called the illusory movement. It's about melancholy, the desire to, uh, des desiring what he possesses. Uh, sorry, this is, so he has an idea in his mind of what he wants to possess. So he has this idea, but he's just really dreaming about it. Um, and the, the second one, stage two, is Papageno in, Mag in Magic Flute, which is a pretty cute opera. Papageno is like this forest guy looking for Papagena, the female. <laughs> and uh, so he's in the seeking phase. Uh, he's, he's seeking, he's desiring an object. Um, and stage three is the Don Giovanni, uh, which is also, he's, he's the character and he's the name of the Mozart opera. And he's this... Don, he's he's Don Juan. He's a guy who's a womanizer. He's um, he's just going around conquering women and you know getting a kick out of it. Um, but they're different. So they're they're different types of desiring. Um, I want to see if I can have a good summary of these. But yeah, basically, like the first one is like a dreaming. Second one is like a seeking, like a desiring, um, and the third one is like a desiring, but like. And also different types, like there could be a Don Giovanni, you know, the famous one is a Don Giovanni where it seeks out like multiple women, like in the extreme, like thousand in over a thousand, right? That, um, over a thousand or something in Spain alone is like the, the famous expression. Uh, and then Mozart or um, Kierkegaard also uh, mentions that there could be a type of Don Giovanni that is like intensely desiring, but just one person, maybe, maybe like funneling all the energy that was previously in the other one and like the the doppelganger in the thousands maybe just funneled into concentrating intensely on one person but he's saying kind of like this one this opera is about the multiplicity don giovanni is like a he's a seducer he's a womanizer um yeah he's a um page 75 don giovanni is a downright seducer he says um and he's on on page 77 this is really reminiscent of, I remember that our crit criticism of, uh, his, Kierkegaard's criticism of um, uh, Hans Christian Andersen in a previous video. Um, he's saying kind of like Don Giovanni is like a succession of moments, you know, experiencing and going after and having sex with all these women. It's a succession of these moments and he's getting high off of being in the moment. And he's like seeking out all these new moments. But there's the problem of it is there's no overarching principle. There's no coherence. It's just sort of like random, like getting your kicks off randomly. Almost like a brave new world, just like getting high all the time. And it's just like there's no point to your life. There's no overarching reason. Um, so I thought that's really similar to the Hans Christian Andersen one where it's like, yeah, he has some cool stories, but he was saying there's no overarching principle or something like that. A, a little bit of a parallel possibly there. Um, um, and let me go through. Yeah, this is, this is really the key. And I didn't write down 
a page, or did I? 79, let's see here. I really put, I put three stars on this one. Um, yeah, he did. He desires and and this desire acts seductively to this extent he does seduce he enjoys the satisfaction of desire as soon as he has enjoyed it he seeks a new object and so it goes on indefinitely um and he he's a deceiver but he's a deceiver in order to keep experiencing to go on there's no satisfaction there's no you know there's just always a constant craving and then getting what he wants and then moving on to the next thing like let me experience the next flavor of ice cream almost like i'm gonna try all the flavors like i just you know um yeah yeah and uh yeah at the end he's just kind of like saying um oh yeah he's he's kind of like comparing let's see i guess there was like a dichotomy saying maybe he was just um so a, a seducer has more purpose um he's actually like scheming and things like that and we'll see this later on in the in the seducer's diary who is all, all obviously a seducer but he has an overarch he he does kind of has a have a purpose he has a sinister purpose um but let me see so yeah at the end it's just page page 83 at the end he just kind of like says um hear the unrestrained craving of passion Hear the sighing of erotic love. Hear the whisper of temptation. Hear the vortex of seduction. Hear the stillness of the moment. Hear, hear, hear Mozart's Don Giovanni. So just go and listen for yourself. Uh, and then at the end, uh, after this, he's talking about different interpretations of this myth that behind us, which is like the, the Don Juan myth. Um, and uh, just a little bit of talk about that. And then on page 112, he's sort of saying, Don Giovanni's essential nature is music. Interesting, interesting. So music is very important to, to this young guy. Uh, he's very into it, especially these Mozart operas. Um, but yeah, just to summarize, uh, there are limits of language where, where language leaves, um, where language leaves off, music begins. And then the second part is there's these three types of aesthetic sages. And we mentioned the page in Figaro, who is like a dreamer. Papageno, Papageno in the Magic Flute, who is like seeking. And Don Giovanni is like a desiring. And those there's two types, like a multiplicity, like over a thousand women. And there's one where it's like intense love for one, one woman. Um, but we're talking about the first one most of all, but d different types in the Don Juan myth, I guess he's kind of saying. So that was pretty long, but uh, I feel like we got through uh, the the big part, the big parts. But what's what's really making this unique and different is is that part where it's kind of saying, you know, words have a limit here, and let's just go off into this land of music and just listen to music, like you know, like it it kind of like presents the arguments for itself, almost like saying like. You know, hey, we can talk about film theory and all this stuff, but at the end of the day, you're going to get something if you go and just see the film for yourself and experience it for yourself. I think that's why a film is, 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 would be relevant if Kirkgaard was alive uh, you know, today. Definitely be interested in it. Uh, the second part we'll go into is um, I didn't find as much interesting in it, but there's some... Things to pull out that I've highlighted. So this part is the tragic and ancient drama reflected in tragic in modern drama. Uh, so he's comparing, you know, the ancient Greek tragedies, you know, the epic tragedies with, um, you know, current dramas. Like, what's the difference? What, what's going on? Um, and just some things that I highlighted that, that sort of stood out to me. Page 119, uh, he's talking about what is isolation. Um, talking about isolation is like one thinking of self, oneself as a number, particularly number one, uh, in isolation to the multiplicity to, to thousands or so forth. And then kind of saying like the numbers are kind of in themselves indifferent. But what he's talking about here is like, we're actually internalizing, oh, I'm one, I need to be more, you know, I need to be with people, right? Like, and actually like that subjective interpretation of the number is the, is the thing that he's talking about here. And that's where, that is what isolation is. That's our interpretation of it. But like, again, very Kierkegaardian throwing out the, these numbers and saying, you know, numbers are generally bad when, when they're mentioned in Kierkegaard. Um, 
Yeah, but like, yeah, interestingly, on page 120, saying our age versus ancient Greek, our age is more depressed, deeper in despair. And um, I think we'd say the same about our, about our own age. But he says there's a reason, like, um, uh, um, you know, modern tragedy kind of lacks this epic character. We're not talking about like the gods, you know, putting humans through suffering and trials. It's like the more these these modern dramas are really like about subjective choices and, and things and guilt and and like the individual making decisions uh, rather than just sort of like being cast into fate and suffering through fate. That's the big difference, really. Uh, yeah, and and kind of saying at the at these like you know there's some there's things that are more intense in both in the ancient there's more sorrow I think of like sorrow you know sorrow under suffering from the gods but there's more in the modern there's more pain there's more guilt and this is page one twenty six um yeah and then um let me see here. I really like this quote I got to bring this up this is one of the good things in, that I really liked in this, I highlighted. Um, talking about uh, repentance and kind of like how that kind of like is treated in modern comedy. Well, let me just read this whole passage because there's two good parts that follow one after the other here. Uh, repentance has a holiness. Uh, oh, this is page 126, by the way. Repentance has a holiness that eclipses the aesthetic. Now that's interesting because now we're going, oh, this is, there's something, oh, you know, past the aesthetic. Oh, that's interesting. Um, A doesn't, isn't really about that. A is all about the aesthetic. but So we'll get into past that eventually in the next book. Uh, Repentance has a holiness that eclipses the aesthetic. It does not want to be seen, least of all to be a spectator, and requires an altogether different kind of self-activity. To be sure, modern comedy has at times brought repentance onto the stage, but this only betrays a lack of judgment on the author. Uh, one is indeed reminded of the psychological interest there, uh, can be seen in repentance depicted, but again, psychological interest is not the aesthetic. This is uh, part of the confusion that manifests itself in so many ways in our day. Something is sought where one should not seek it, and what is worse, one it is found where one should not find it. One wishes to be edified in the theater, to be aesthetically stimulated in church. One wishes to be converted by novels, uh, to be entertained by devotional books. One wishes to have philosophy in the pulpit and a preacher in the lecture platform. This is this pain then is not aesthetic pain, and yet it is obviously. Uh, that which the present age is working toward as the supreme tragic interest. So, you know, I like this idea of like looking for the, the things in the wrong places and, you know, trying to be entertained while you're in church. Like that's not the place for that to happen. And I think about modern churches that I've been to where it's like they're putting on like laser light shows and it's like a rock concert, which is cool. Like if there's a bit of that, I guess like, you know, people get into that. But like if you make that all about the experience, that becomes like the entertainment. It's like at that point you might as well just go to like a movie theater. Like if that's what you want or go to a concert or whatever. Like I don't know, like but the church is a different place for that. You know, go to the, the church for the the um, you, where you want to be converted. Right. Or or where you want to hear. um uh, yeah, that, that is the, the part. Or or edified or converted. Like that's the place where, where things happen in the church, right? So like to each 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 place has their own you know, own thing you should and you shouldn't be seeking for these things in the wrong places. But there there's an idea of there's some comedy in that. Um, uh, and then there's some some little transition on the page one thirty one starting to talk about sort of what is unique for our own age is this anxiety, which is a very like personal experience. Um, and talking about like, yeah, there's sorrow in um, in the ancient dramas, but there's not really this anxiety. This anxiety is like a way of personalizing the sorrow. What he, what he says is appropriating the sorrow. Let me just read off of there. Um, Here at once I have a definition of the tragic in modern times for an anxiety is a reflection. And in that respect is essentially different from sorrow. Anxiety is the vehicle by which the subject appropriates sorrow and assimilates it. 
Anxiety is the motive power by which sorrow penetrates a person's heart, but the movement is not swift like that of an arrow. It is consecutive. It is not once and for all. It is a continual becoming. As an passionately erotic glance craves its object, so anxiety looks cravenly upon sorrow. Just as the quiet, incorruptible eye of love is preoccupied with the Beloved object, so anxiety's self preoccupation is with sorrow. Now, anxiety is intensely personal and subjective. Uh, it's this experience that's, you know, he says it's appropriate, appropriated subjectively. That just means that there's a person experiencing that anxiety, right? That's like a very personal type of sorrow. Um, yeah, and then on page 132, I really like this. Um, um, let me see where this is. Furthermore, uh, page 132, furthermore, anxiety always contains a reflection on time, for I cannot be anxious about the present, but only about the past or the future. Um, but the past and the future kept in opposition to each other in such a way that the present vanishes are categories of reflection. And he's, he's just saying here, again, about the time thing, like the present is a, is a special place. And he's saying... Anxiety doesn't exist in the present. Really? Because are you, yeah, and if you think about that, you know, are you anxious? It's, it's because you're usually anxious about something that's going to happen, right? Or are you anxious about something that happened? You're never really ancient, anxious about what's just happening now, what you're experiencing now. It's interesting. Uh, is it true, do you think? Can you think of times where maybe this, this, this seems to be right, though, if I think about it, right? You're usually anxious about the, the future, right? And your your anxiety comes from not being in the moment and not concentrating on the moment. Uh, and then, yeah, that makes me think of a, a quote from Jesus, you know. Uh, Every day has troubles of its own, right? I think it's like the Sermon on, on the Mount. On the Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount. Each day has troubles of its own. Just concentrate on today's troubles. Really just saying, you know, be in the moment today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Think about tomorrow when tomorrow is actually here, right? So um, be more thinking about today and try to you know, think about today as the present moment almost. Uh, of course, you could split up the day, right? There's 24 hours in a day. It's a lot of time. So there's a past now. I mean, it's the middle of the day now. So there's a past and the future of the day. But generally, like today is where things can happen, right? Or I can get things done. Tomorrow is more abstract, more in the future, so I shouldn't be worrying as much about that. Um, but yeah, talking about the, yeah anxiety's relation to the tragic. Anxiety, therefore, belongs essentially to the tragic. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and then the rest of this, I'm not super interested in these types of discussions, but uh, Kirkroll really goes to town on what is Antigone about and uh, talking about this. Didn't really get as much of, of that. If you're into those, you know, ancient dramas and so forth, like maybe you would get more out of that. But um, yeah, yep. he's going to do this again a couple more times in this book and I'm going to kind of skip through it. But there might be some nuggets in there that I'll, I'll mention. But I think we're, we're good for, for today. So next time uh, we got, got a few little sort of vignettes. We got silhouettes. We got the first love, or we got silhouettes, the unhappiest one, the first love, and then we'll have the seducer's diary at the end there. So, and then we'll be done with this first book finally. We'll move on to the second part uh, where the author uh, B is talking about, you know, why you should live ethically in the ethical stage, uh, which is that whole other different sphere of existence or stage of existence. Um, so, yeah, I uh, hope you join me next time. And uh, sorry, <laughs> this one was a this was a long one, but there's a lot to unpack. So hope you got something out of it. Um, but uh, hopefully I'll see you next time. But yeah, thanks for listening. Bye.